Uh, good evening, everybody. And thank you so much to coming to the launch of the South Australian AgTech Strategic Plan. Um, thank you also for everybody that's joining via Zoom tonight. Um, you are very welcome to keep your cameras on. I think we'll actually be able to see you on the screen behind us if you do, but we would also be able to hear you. So if you don't mind muting your microphones, that would be awesome. But um, also as the session goes on, please do feel free to ask any questions um, via the chat functionality in Zoom. And if we bring you in to ask any questions live, we'll let you know just before we bring you in and, we'll, and unmute yourself and everybody in the room will be able to hear you. So thank you also for everybody that joins online. Um, so I'm Ollie Madgett. Um, I'm here to be your MC this evening. Uh, just by way of quick introduction, I'm a grape grower based down in McLaren Vale and also help to organize ag tech meetups that bring together uh, developers with with farmers and other people in the ag tech ecosystem. So our group's about 1,200 strong now, and actually there's loads of the community here tonight, so it's fantastic to see you all. So yeah, please feel free, if you get a spare moment, just Google ag tech meetup Adelaide and, and feel free to join the community. It's all very open. Um, I'm a member of also of the SA um, ag tech advisory group, and there is a couple of other of us here tonight. So uh, I just wouldn't mind if you don't mind standing up when I introduce you. So it's Dr. Leanna Reed who's our independent chair. We've got Michelle Lally here as well. Uh, and I also over towards the back, we've got Penny Schultz there as well. And then I think the rest of the board is uh, uh, joining on Zoom and, and avoiding having to stand up here. So I've been hospital past this rail. So um, um, I'd also like to start by acknowledging um, that we're meeting on the traditional country of the Karuna people of the Adelaide Plains, um, and we recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship with the land, and acknowledge the historic and continuing role that they play in, in Australia's great agricultural story. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge a number of VIPs that we have here tonight. So we have the Honourable David Basham, um, we have Professor Caroline McMillan, South Australia's Chief Scientist, we have Catherine Sayer, CEO of Food, um, of Food South Australia. Brian Smedley, uh, the CEO of the South Australian Wine Industry Association. And also I'd like to um, say a thank you uh, to Chris Kirk over in the back from Stone and Chalk. And thank you as ever for, for hosting this here today uh, and putting on this amazing kind of um, tech system that we have supporting us online. I'm just in terms of a tiny bit of housekeeping. Toilets are just out the back. Um, if for any reason we need to leave the building, that's just through those doors to the right. And if everybody just, you know, for COVID um, safety, if everybody can make sure that they've just registered as they come in by the little touch screens, that would be really appreciated. Um, but without further, ado, uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome the Honourable David Basham to come and give the introductory speech. Thank you. Uh, th thanks very much, Holly. Um, welcome to those in the room and online uh, for the launch of the South Australian Ag Tech Strategic Plan. This is an exciting day for South Australia as we use this plan as a blueprint to drive technology adoption on farm. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the tireless work of the Ag Tech Advisory Group, led by Independent Chair Dr. Leanna, uh, Leanna uh, Reid, in bringing uh, this plan to fruition. The passion and the enthusiasm amongst that group is second to none. The government recognises the enormous opportunities for our farmers to be able to capitalise on great adoption of technology on farm. Australian agriculture has a goal of, of reaching $100 billion farm gate output by 2030, from 69 billion in 1819. With the vast majority of arable land currently in use, one of the key drivers to achieving this goal is the development, commercial, commercialization and adoption of ag tech. The project increase in South, Australia, in South Australian agriculture, gross value of production if current ag tech offerings were adopted is estimated at up to $2.6 billion per annum. As a dairy farmer, I was aware of the importance of technology in the farming systems and the benefits it can provide. In understanding that current state of play of ag tech adoption in South Australia, 
we undertook a survey, oh, sorry, yeah, we undertook a survey which found more than 50% of primary producers are currently not investing in technology on farm. Most concerning um, in the survey found it 18% of primary producers told us they're not planning to invest in technology in the future. This is a statistic in which the, this government through its strategic plan is putting pos positive policies in place, place to improve. The Ag Tech strategic plan is a key pillar of the government's growth state uh, target for food, wine and agribusiness of $23 billion by 2030. The South Australian agriculture sector faces a period of unprecedented challenges uh, with the global threat of COVID-19, drought and recent bushfires. These challenges act both as a con uh, constraint to the sector and a major motivator for innovation. One of the most significant sources of innovation will come from the application of ag tech, from sensors and farm management software, imagery, smart farm equipment and genomics to, to agriculture chain. And I was lucky enough to be up at the wait um, this morning, having a look at some of the things going on there. And um, I saw a, um, a vehicle that's gonna replace my agronomist. Um, uh, they tell me it's about as slow as the agronomist was doing his pasture walk, but uh, an amazing piece of technology to assess um, the biomass, um, taking photos as it trans, uh, uh, transverses the countryside to help uh, calibrate satellites um, in their ability to um, read what's there on the ground. The adoption of ag tech can help South Australian primary producers enhance production efficiency and business profitability and resilience. However, we yet to realise the full potential value of adopting ag tech, particularly on farm. That's why we established an ag tech advisory group in 2019 to provide a high level strategic advice to the state government to inform decision making on the practical application and adoption of ag tech on farm. Their first task was to develop a strategic plan to enhance ag tech adoption in the state. We've started the ball rolling in supporting ag tech adoption uh, with the rollout of ag tech demonstration farms at Loxton and Struan. An ag tech start, start up hub run by Think Lab at Loxton and hosting the inaugural ag ad advanced ag with more than 330 people in attendance. There's still much more work to be, to, to be done today. And I'm pleased today I'm announcing a uh, $2.4 million to kick off the objectives of strategic plan, which will mean uh, expanding ag tech demonstration farms at Newry, uh, Tarratfield, Minipa, and a site over at Port Lincoln. We'll also be establishing ag tech startup hubs in the Southeast and Air Peninsula. A another important element of this funding is for ag tech intermediaries, uh, which is a, a form of extension officer. For the first time in South Australia, we'll have collaboration and cohesive blueprint for the adoption of ag tech. This plan needs to be industry driven, buy-in and action will be required for a full range of stakeholders. The journey starts tonight. I'm confident the strategic plan will drive adoption of ag tech across the state's primary production sector, creating significant value for the entire supply chain from ag tech development through to the food, market, uh, food processing and marketing. The advisory group will now begin work on advice to government on implementing the seven pillars of the plan. I look forward to this success this plan brings for South Australia's ag tech industries. I will now hand over to the MC, Ollie, to continue tonight's, tonight's proceedings and thank you all for attending this important launch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. Um, and now I'd like to introduce our um, keynote speaker, which is Dr. Leanna Reid. So just by way of introduction, um, Leanna actually was originally an ag science graduate um, back in the day, and she has experience on boards that address innovation across government, industry and research and research organizations, particularly in the biotech sector. This includes current roles as the chair of the SA Biotechnology Companies, Carina Biotech, Tech Psych, um, and previous role where she was the MD of 
TGR Biosciences. Liana also chairs Health Translation SA and is a board member of Unisee um, Venture Capital, uh, Biosensis, and the RSPCA SA. It's all quite a mouthful yeah. for me. Um, Liana will present the AgTech uh, strategic plan for South Australia. Uh, and following Liana's presentations, we're going to have a bit of a panel session. So please do um, um, keep uh, any questions in mind. And also for everybody, again, that's online, um, we'll be kind of, um, if you write any questions that you've got in the chat function, we'll be picking some out and also um, bringing you live to air so that you can ask them um, directly to the panel at the end of Liana's presentation. So um, Liana, please over to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ollie, and, and thank you, Minister, for your uh, uh, great introduction. Um, so it's, it's a delight here to be able to come back again here because we uh, gave uh, a preview of the plan in July uh, where we had had a, over uh, inputs from over 600 or so people. Uh, we got further feedback after that and we've incorporated that into our plan. So we're presenting to you what is still a high-level plan. We've got a lot of work to do to get into the detail, but... Uh, very pleased to be here tonight uh, presenting that for you. And um, I'll just move on. As the Minister mentioned, we, the Act Advisory Group uh, is driving this plan uh, and has involved widespread consultation. Now, the purpose of our plan uh, is uh, focused around adoption of Ag Tech, as the Minister said. So, uh, along, you can see this chain here. Uh, with highlighted the on-farm production uh, uptake. Uh, having said that, we recognise that really the whole value is in this full chain. Um, and what we really have to be doing in Australia generally, not just South Australia, of course, is focusing much more on value-add industries. And if you look around and say, well, okay, what, what industry sector could we really make a great bang with our buck for uh, internationally? I think you'd have to say that the agriculture, agribusiness sector is one of those. Uh, and ag tech is going to be a key driver of that. So while we're focusing at the moment, in this particular stage, on how we can get more ag tech into the farming sector, um, it's this whole chain that needs to be working absolutely optimised and synergistically to make this a reality. Uh, so our work is starting on adoption, but I think that's really just the start of it, Minister, uh, once we've solved that problem. But important to focus, I think, and that's why we're doing this. The Minister has mentioned the importance of uh, the agribusiness. In South Australia, it's a, a, over a $15 billion per annum industry already. Uh, we uh, hope to grow that to uh, $23 billion per annum by 2030. That's a fairly optimistic uh, aim, but uh, it's good to, to be ambitious. But ag tech has been estimated that it could add 2.6 billion per annum, as the minister said, uh, to our um, uh, gross value of production in agriculture. Uh, so it's an, an enormous uh, opportunity. But our problem that we've identified, and it's quite broad and, and throughout the whole sector has identified this problem, is that we have a lot of ag tech solutions that are either coming along or are in place uh, as technologies, but we're not adopting them that well on farm at this point. It's really largely restricted to sensors uh, and software for farm management and precision agriculture, but huge opportunities much more broadly. So um, in looking at that, uh, what are the challenges that were identified in our plan? And I've just given you high level here. You'll see more detail in the, in the written plan. And they came under these three areas. And the first is that um, to the producers in particular, uh, the value proposition isn't always clear. Perhaps it's not even there yet because it's too, technology is too early. It might not be defined, and that might be not just return on investment in, a, in an economic sense, but perhaps what, it, what are the other values that it offers. Um, it might not be fit for purpose. You know, How are we going to take this widget to market as opposed to what does a producer actually need? What are the challenges they face day to day? And even if all that's in place... Um, our production sector is agricultural production is, is under uh, economic stress and probably all of the capital in some cases has already been committed. So it might be the best technology in the world, but I haven't got the money to do that. So the value proposition, value for money, and yes, I can make this investment because I can really see the return is not always there. Now, even if the, the, the tech sector is, you know, can come up with good arguments for that, 
does the producer actually understand what's on offering and particularly what's on offering, you know, for me, you know, not as opposed to a general idea of what's available, you know, what, what's it going to do for me? That's the problem as well. Um, and that takes an education process. And that's not surprising because the ag tech sector itself in developing these technologies is very new, very exciting uh, and, and expanding, uh, but relatively immature. So not surprising, new technologies are often, you know, a tad hard to understand. Uh, there's also, uh, in, because of that, the producers don't always have enough knowledge of what it can do for them to say, yeah, I'll adopt this or I'll reject it. And when they do get advice, what they would prefer to, to be is from people they trust. As we, you know, we all like that, you know, I know so-and-so and I believe that person uh, is a good, good fellow and I trust what they say. So as opposed to someone who would come along with a, you know, the white shoe brigade or whatever and try and sell me something. So um, they prefer often advice from peers, from, their, from you know, the farm next door. I like that guy, he's uh, a woman doing really well. Uh, I, they're using this ag tech, I'm gonna try it too. As opposed to particularly if you're the inventor of all the, all the companies selling the technology, well, you might get the response, well, you would say that. So having advice from people that, that the producers trust. And then from the entrepreneur's point of view, um, what they need to find are more people who will test the technology so that you get those people that the other people trust and will adopt it from. And that's a bit of a vicious cycle if you haven't got many people using it. And they're, as we call them, the early adopters. How can, how can, the, how can we provide the tech developers with more people who will trial that technology so that it actually gets there, uh, can iron out the problems and get further adoption. Now, even if the value proposition has been made by, uh, by the company that's developing it and the producers understand, say, yeah, I can see how this would really benefit me, it's still not always that easy to use some of the technology. Uh, internet connectivity is a real problem in, in rural areas. Uh, uh, so that's got to improve a lot. Uh, if you're gonna use things that you have to get out your phone or iPad for, and you haven't got any connectivity, well, you're not going to use it. And then products need to be easy to use, integrated and easy to use. If you're a producer out there on a tractor and you've got to manage about 10 apps at once, you, you know, you're just going to say, well, to hell with that. So it has to be integrated and easy to use. And of course, if you're coming up with new technologies, this, this manufacturer is over here and this one's over here, that's not necessarily going to be in place in the first instance. And then it's a changing field, rapidly changing field. So it's not just telling people how to do things once. You need ongoing training so that it actually remains uh, consistently um, available and workable. So that's a lot of challenges. Um, we have these seven pillars that we've mentioned under which we're developing strategies. As I said, still fairly high level. We've got to really get down in the ditches and get the detailed strategies in place. Uh, but that's the work for the the, the ag tech group coming up. The first one that and I think is the biggie is bringing people together, uh, calling it networking and collaboration. And, and this is not uh, exclusive to the, uh, the ag sector. Uh, it's a common problem across a whole lot of industry sectors. Um, don't develop technologies in isolation of the end users. Bring them together and bring them together frequently so that you know, you, you're pressure testing and, and developing technologies always in conjunction with what the end user needs. Now for this area, we, what we have two approaches that we're recommending. One we're calling an ag tech clusters program um, where you, you bring together people frequently, you get to know each other because you, it's, you work with people you trust um, and uh, covering the gambit, the researchers, the tech developers, the industry advisors, uh, governments uh, where necessary and business uh, and the end users, the producers. Uh, we're not talking really hard infrastructure. We've got a lot of hard infrastructure around the place. It's really bringing people together. That's got to be the focus. And it will be got to be end user focus. What's going to be the address the issues that people need to do, providing education, providing demonstration. But that less formal thing, which is already undergoing is a, a sort of forums and showcasing events that bring people together. And we already have, um, I, I think the advanced ag first uh, meeting was, was very successful last year. And ag tech meetups that uh, Ollie um, in particular 
um, drives, very, very effective ways of, of getting people to know each other and understanding what's on offering in a very personal way. And I think we could do more to, uh, to build on those programs. The second one, demonstrating an understanding, and this all goes together. These are not independent type initiatives. Um, I think we mentioned um, uh, intermediaries and ambassadors. Um, that is people who, uh, if, if you're trying to say, well, you've got the producer over, over here and you've got the developer here, uh, people who can sit in the middle and understand both needs of, of both sides are absolutely like gold. So people who can help bring together uh, the, uh, the, those different people in different parts of the sector are going to be enormously important. Um, so that you can introduce a producer to a developer and, and the developer can make sure that, that it's being done in the right way that, that producers need that. Um, and demonstration sites, uh, the minister mentioned, uh, uh, we're very pleased to hear some, uh, about 2.4 million of extra funding going towards demonstration sites and indeed um, some innovation hubs which fit in a way with our cluster program as a, as a way of building those. Uh, because demonstrating those in a real life situation, preferably, if possible, in a really commercially relevant situation. So you can actually see, okay, in real life, this is how this works. And of course, you can improve it under those sort of circumstances too, if you're a developer. And the, the entrepreneurial capability of the ag tech developers themselves is crucial. Um, how do we grow that? How does it become an industry, you know, com globally competitive in its own right? Uh, 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 and well linked with end users. I think this is an area we're just touching on because our focus is on adoption. And I think this is an area we need a whole uh, set of work in, in itself. Skills and education, I mentioned. Um, then I think there's, there's, a, there's the um, ongoing re-education and new education of uh, producers. Um, as, as you're going along, but also for schools and curriculum, the, the future workforce, uh, really making sure that we're doing that. As an ag science graduate, I can re really appreciate the quality of that degree. And yet we're still going in, in, in this current day, the, uh, the cutoff scores that you need to go into agriculture is, is so much lower than some other fields. Uh, it's crazy, it's such an important field. Um, this network connectivity problem, we do have a range of solutions around. So it's not necessarily coming up with new solutions, but there are providers who will say, go out to farms and say, okay, you need A, B, C, D, and I'll help you put it together to improve connectivity under, um, uh, in, in remote areas. And the technology uh, compatibility side of things, again, if we go back to the clusters and demonstration sites and intermediaries, these sort of mechanisms all link together and part of the process would be saying, well, can we combine technologies A, B and C and really come up with one solution that addresses a range of needs. Government leadership is crucial, Minister, um, as you've recognised, thank you. Uh, we're exploring a number of uh, initiatives that the government might put in place, particularly to address market failure. Uh, the government doesn't want to step in where the private sector should do it. Uh, but also just that leadership, the fact that the government has put this up in lights as an important initiative is important because it drives industry confidence that this is an important area. So if you're an investor or a, a, a business thinking, will I put more of my money into this? It, it creates that more of a feeling of confidence. Well, we do have a number of uh, activities underway uh, or, or in the process uh, of, of being developed. And I've just listed some of those here. Uh, that area in terms of networking um, and the um, uh, events, um, pleased to advance that Advance Ag 2021 will be held on the 23rd of July next year, so at the Convention Centre, so keep that in mind. And what we do here, of course, is a particular focus on show, showcasing new innovations and how they can be used on farm, so that it's really squarely focused at that adoption level. The demonstration farms that we're just putting new funding to, we already have a number in place. The Turretville and Port Lincoln ones are, are, are a work in progress, but the others are in place. Uh, and they address uh, specific local needs. And I think the, I, uh, we had a presentation uh, on the wine industry strategy and mentioning how important it is to take into account local needs. 
and I, I really took that point home. It's very important that you can't put the same things in place for perhaps for a dry land area like Air Peninsula as you might for down the southeast. So the demonstration farms, multiple of them, are designed for specific uh, area conditions and also for whatever is the agriculture of that area. So not surprisingly, Struan is on livestock, New York for on viticulture, for example. And they're building industry partnerships. So elders are involved quite actively in this program. And I, we hope uh, further industry partners because that brings, um, I guess, the, the commercial reality to these. Um, all of these uh, um, demonstration sites are now open for expressions of interest from uh, technology developers who want to go and demonstrate their, their opportunities there. Uh, in fact, I think they've been just so far, even though most of these demonstration sites are fairly new, they've received 40 applications uh, to, to, to te uh, showcase technologies, um, of which most of them, 30 or so, have been accepted. Um, so it, it's uh, looking like it's a, a program that's going to get legs. Uh, the regional ag tech innovation and startup hubs, uh, which uh, we mentioned in Loxton, the Think Lab, um, University of Adelaide's Think Lab is now has a Loxton a regional site and planning others in these uh, Struan and Air Peninsula as well. And they bring together entrepreneurs and companies, uh, associations, communities to develop innovations and business models and provide mentoring and a range of other services. So it's, goes, it's, it's part of that jigsaw of the networking and collaboration. We, uh, in terms of entrepreneurship, we already have a, a range of programs in place and often headquartered from, from this uh, very facility here. I've uh, listed a number of them there. Uh, I think in, what we don't want to do in this program is, is try to reinvent the wheel, duplicate things. Um, so I think our first step would be to look at those opportunities, how they're being developed for the uh, uh, ag tech industry, and uh, are they adequately servicing ag tech opportunities? How might we build on that? That will be the analysis that we'll do to start with. And then we have a range of sector specific um, uh, growth programs already being developed or in place. And I've just listed a couple of here. The uh, PERSA is developing the red meat and wool growth program. And uh, uh, um, the um, Wine Australia is developing its uh, driving adoption of agri-food technology. Now that's across the whole wine um, um, spectrum from, from research through to the actual formal wine production, whereas we're focusing on uh, adoption on farm. Uh, but there's a lot of similarities in the, identifying the same kind of problems, particularly that need for um, linking people together, end user focus, and uh, the, the concept of the intermediaries comes across. And uh, our chief scientist, Caroline McMillan, launched a week or so ago uh, her Excite strategy, which is uh, designing around building innovation uh, across the, the whole, uh, whole industry sectors uh, of importance, and agribusiness is one of those sectors in South Australia. And again, there's a lot of similarities with, with the work that we're doing, particularly in that, that concept of intermediaries, uh, to be able to link uh, groups together um, and driving adoption of technology into the marketplace. So yeah, I think our, our first, one of the first things that we will do as a group is, is, is work with these other entities and make sure that our programs are uh, uh, synergistic um, and integrated as opposed to try to reinvent and do things in parallel. The other areas I think that I, I think our group will, will start to look at um, and, and uh, are not underway at this one is, is then what is it amongst all that that we could scope as our clusters program, uh, which would, may well have to be a number of clusters because they might have to be sector specific, subsector specific because you wouldn't necessarily do the same thing in, in one sector versus another of agriculture. Um, and, but I think also to develop a, a proposal that we might put to government for um, a fund. Um, we like co-funding of that from industry so that there's real buy-in from the commercial sector there. Um, and that would be focused at market gaps or opportunities that are not, are not or, or, or cannot be fully developed by the private sector itself and driving game-changing innovations and their uptake into practice. 
Um, so I think that could be a, a real incentive for groups to get together and supplement some of the programs such as the Gravity Challenge and th that's, uh, that's underway. So I just come back to finish with this um, uh, pipeline of, of uh, the sector. And really to emphasize, I think it's an extremely exciting time to be involved with agriculture and ag tech. You go now to the national meetings like Evoke Ag and there is such a buzz uh, around about this opportunity. Um, and, you know, I wonder sometimes, I'd sometimes show a rather uh, un unfriendly slide of a, a picture of Australia with um, uh, bulldozers digging it up and putting it on the ships and shipping it overseas. And, and you know, we have in the past been a commodities based country, uh, dig it up, ship it out. And it's made us, it's, it's put us in a very, very good position economically and socially, uh, but the future is value adding. Um, we're not going to be able to have that same benefit, I don't believe, going forward. And if you look across the different industries that, you know, where could Australia really position itself to be a powerhouse worldwide? I think you'd have to get excited about agriculture and ag tech. So uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be involved with this at the moment. And, uh, congratulate the government for its foresight in, in seeing this as something to stimulate. Um, and we really look forward to uh, helping to develop this uh, strategy. And I'll just finish by thanking our Ag Tech Advisory Group, who are a pas very passionate group and committed group. Uh, Andrew Grant, Michelle Lally, Andrew Lowe, Ollie Madgett, uh, Dougal McComish, uh, Tom Rayner, Penny Schultz, and Jim uh, Wally. And also uh, Ben Baghurst, who's, uh, where are you, Ben? Over there. Uh, ben is executive officer for our group and has put enormous effort in to bringing this together. Thank you, Ben, very much appreciated. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Liana. Um, and I would now like to um, introduce Matthew Pryor. So Matthew's going to be speaking to us uh, online from, from Melbourne. Just by way of Matthew, if you don't already know him, Please do look him up and connect with him on LinkedIn. He's one of the most sort of interesting and, and influential people in ag tech in Australia. So uh, he's actually one of the very few entrepreneurs that has founded an, um, an ag tech startup in Observant that he's then taken right the way through to um, its acquisition by Jan Rain about three years ago. And then he's gone on from that and then has uh, been one of the partners of Tenacious Ventures, which is the first ag tech investment fund here in Australia. Um, they've already been investing in some of the best startups uh, here, like GoTerra, an insect farm in, um, automated insect farm in, that started in Canberra. Also Swarm Farm, which is a, um, an autonomous uh, tractor company based in, I think it's uh, Emerald in Queensland, doing like amazing things. And actually last week, they invested in one of the most exciting carbon marketplaces in the world called Nori. So, and that's kind of the private sector's um, real push into the carbon markets. And then, uh, as well as being at Tenacious Ventures, uh, Matthew also is one of the partners at Agthentic, which runs the Farmers to Founders um, Accelerator Program. Uh, and, yeah, just involved in so much stuff. Rockets, one of the founders of Rocket Cedar as well, um, which is a food and ag accelerator from Melbourne. Um, and I'm, Matthew's just going to come and, obviously, he was one of the founders of the Australian Agritech Association just wants to give us an introduction into the association and also hopefully sort of give us some structure of how, where, you know, where the South Australian um, ag tech plan can fit in with things nationally and where the ecosystem's moving. So um, over to you, Matthew. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Holly. How's that audio coming through? Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. All good. Uh, hi, everybody. Yeah, it's uh, a little weird to uh, to be presenting in this way. My apologies for the cans, but my uh, AirPods decided that today was the day they were going to die and uh, I wasn't able to get a replacement uh, any, any faster. Uh, first, I'd like to start by thanking um, uh, the Minister and, and, and Ben uh, at Persa for the opportunity to come and uh, make a brief uh, presentation today. You know, we're, we're just so pleased to see this uh, position of leadership that South Australia is taking in this field. Um, and whilst, you know, there's plenty of opportunity for both state level and national level initiative, that there's nothing like uh, leadership to kind of show the way. And in particular, the real emphasis on 
uh, solving for adoption. It's, it's something that's very close to our heart and something that uh, in my entrepreneurial journey, certainly experienced. So yeah, would, would like to say, you know, congratulations on, uh, you know, a lot of foresight there and, and, and showing leadership and certainly uh, let's hope that um, uh, every, all, all the other states and federal governments kind of uh, take the initiative and, and really start to focus on the opportunities of Agritech. So, you know, briefly touching on that, um, you know, we've, we've heard a lot about and talked a lot about uh, our country's aspirations to increase the level of, of gross value production and, and farm gate output and adoption clearly is, is fundamental to that. Uh, you know, the kind of figures, I guess, are something in the order of $20 billion out of that $100 billion is expected to come from further adoption of technology which is fabulous and will be a major contributor to the economic prosperity of the country, creating jobs in regional areas and continuing to push our international reputation as a world-class producer of fruit and fiber. In fact, we, you know, we, we punch well above our weight uh, as an exporter. We, you know, it's of that, the 60 billion that's currently uh, produced, you know, roughly 40 of that is, is export. That's almost 80%. Uh, that puts us, you know, about 15th in the world, uh, but it third, uh, that's a 3% roughly of the total value of trade in um, uh, agricultural produce, which is great. But the other thing that adoption will do is help to create a sustainable and vibrant agri-tech ecosystem. And that's all the companies uh, that we're talking about tonight who will have a vibrant market in Australia for their products and services. But there's another opportunity that sits alongside that opportunity to export a hundred or more billion dollars worth of food and fiber. And that is the global marketplace for products in the agri-tech sector. That is currently estimated to be a $500 billion market. And it is estimated to be growing at 8% compound annual growth rate. So it'll be around about $720 billion uh, by 2023. So one, one of the challenges with uh, us as a producer is we have limits. We have limits of arable land, we have limits of water, uh, and we are to varying degrees uh, at the discretion of international governments in terms of trade policy. The amazing thing about that $700 billion opportunity is there is no limit to the level at which we can participate. And whilst today our, uh, the amount of export income that we currently earn from that may be quite modest, uh, there is no reason why we can't have an aspiration for that to be tens of billions of dollars. And that's a big prize. And in the same way, uh, when we look at kind of industry growth, you know, uh, Australia also has been a significant exporter of, of mineral resources, but we now have a very vibrant sector in the kind of, uh, you know, mineral uh, mining equipment and technology services sector. In fact, there's an industry growth centre dedicated to the growth of that uh, industry. And that is exactly what the Australian Agritech Association has been created to do, to individually kind of recognise the need for agritech uh, as, a, as, a, as an independent sector to have a industry-led voice for agritech and to help Australian agritech entrepreneurs take hold of that opportunity, which you know, is twofold. The first and, and, and very important is to help Australia maintain its well-deserved reputation and leverage the decades of investment that we've made in research and development in this country. But secondarily, we can be a really material contributor to the economic growth of the country. And that's really what we're looking to do. So if that sounds interesting, if you want to get involved, I strongly encourage you all to go to ozagritech.org. You can sign up, you can join the Slack community. Um, this, this won't happen without leadership and, and everybody hopefully who's listening uh, and watching tonight can, can be part of, of building the important industry component. Leonor, I think just mentioned that, you know, there are plenty of things that government will, will do really well and it's fantastic to see leadership in this area, but there are also plenty of things that we as an industry have to do ourselves. Um, and that will only happen with people kind of jumping in the boat and grabbing hold of an oar and, and pulling on it. So I encourage you all to, to become part of uh, the community. Thanks very much.
Lovely. I'll, thank you so much, Matthew. And, uh, and Matthew's going to um, hold on for us for a few more minutes, um, just while we actually invite a couple of other people to join Liana um, up on the stage. So joining Liana will be Penny Schultz, uh, who'll be just coming in, and also Tim uh, Johnson. I'll give you guys both a quick introduction, if that's okay. So um, Penny is, is obviously also on the, on the advisory board here, but she is a beef and sheep farmer from down in the southeast. Uh, she's actually just... Uh, well, so you are a, a, actually an end user of a lot of ag tech products. You've, you've seen value propositions presented to you both good and bad. Um, she's just finished her PhD on the adoption of technology in, in farming. I think you said it went in about three days ago. So she's been up until <laughs> one o'clock in the morning for about the last uh, two months. So um, yeah. Uh, so this is Penny. Um, she's actually also um, South Australia's um, board member on the Australian Agritech Association that, that um, Matthew is the founder of. So things are starting to kind of join up in lots of positive ways. So thank you so much, Penny. Um, and then we also got um, Tim Johnson. So Tim um, is actually, I first met Tim when Tim, uh, so Tim is one of the um, directors of Breed Elite. And I first met Tim about three odd years ago. You started to come to some of our um, ag tech meetups when you were studying ag science here in Adelaide. And then you were actually one of the winners of the e-challenge that Adelaide University put on. So there was a challenge that was backed by Australian Wool Innovation that, that um, Tim was one of the winners of with Breed Elite. So, and Tim's um, co-founder at Breed Elite is actually his dad. So his mum and dad are both um, uh, vets. His dad very helpfully is also a developer. So quite an amazing combination. And they're, they're actually a real, very sort of, again, lots of people in South Australia, there's lots of really exciting ag tech companies that often are really hidden just behind the surface. They're very, um, you know, you don't shout about your successes, but this is actually, um, Breed Elite is one of those startups that's actually really scaling. So Tim will probably talk about um, what, what they do, or, or I can ask him in a second. But yeah, just amazing, but very, very modest, but a real example of a success that's quietly bubbling away here in South Australia. So, um, so also, I'll be looking out for any questions online. So if anybody's got any questions, um, James uh, Proust, I saw a question from you just a second ago. So we might bring you in, in in just a few moments. But yeah, just probably throwing to the floor to, to start with, Ben's got... Um, a microphone to give anybody who's got a question on the floor. Um, please, if you don't mind, just wait until Ben hands you the mic so that everybody online can hear you really clearly. So um, um, please, any questions for any of, uh, um, any of our guests up here at the front? Ah, just over there at the, at the back there, Ben. Oh, and Michelle's gonna kindly, just over in the gray suit. Uh, Martin Andrew, to, to what extent do we really understand the actual barriers to adoption of this technology? And to what extent then did this plan really, really nail those, those issues so that we know it's going to be really effective? Yeah, I guess um, I sit on a, a few sides of the fence because also off farm, I work with farmers in livestock extension, so running training education programs for farmers. Um, I think some of them were highlighted in the um, presentation from Liana and in the plan itself, in the strategy, um, which is about demonstrating return on investment and value proposition. Um, that seems to be a key, key barrier, um, as well as maybe upskilling both um, farmers and growers and developers um, in um, either recognising or calculating that return on investment or being able to demonstrate it. Um, I think in the past some products really haven't had a great value proposition or haven't been well communicated, which has maybe tainted the market a little bit. Um, and um, a lot of the initiatives like demonstration farms and entrepreneurial programs like Farmers to Founders are going a fairly long way to try and, try and alleviate that, that barrier. Uh, thank you for the, the question. I, I was surprised with our survey that we did, which had over 600 uh, respondents from across the, the gambit, from 
um, the developers through to the, the producers and so forth. Very consistent responses. Um, so, you know, the industry advisors, we ask them what do they think uh, their clients uh, saw as the major problems. So we got very consistent results. And I think it was about 57% said that this return on investment issue uh, so I don't understand what it offers. It was was it was a key problem, and the other ones were raised too. So they're exactly the ones that we got feedback on. The other aspect, I guess, is you know we still don't know everything, of course. Uh, but I think if we put in place the effective uh, structures and intermediaries uh, and uh, clusters, uh, that will be a mechanism by which we will keep to identify you know things that perhaps we didn't see before. And then we can move on that. So it's a dynamic thing. So I think we're, it's a start. Uh, and I was very impressed with the consistency that we got, uh, which says I think they have to be real. But I'm sure there's uh, other things will keep popping up. And uh, there's another Peter. Um, if we can just ask one more question, then we'll go. Um, I think, Pip, if you can stand by online, we're going to try and throw to online, which is always a, a heart-stopping moment. But Peter, over to you. Thanks, Solly. It's oh. Peter Hayes. Uh, thanks for that presentation and this launch. I think it's fantastic. The things that seem to go missing in a lot of this, though, are when we get past the early adopters, the adventurous ones, what can be done to minimise, to de-risk the issue of taking on the new technology? It strikes me that people will take on a technology of, if it fails and they're sanguine about it, that's fine. But those that have bet their own personal bank on it their farm's data or their business's data, this issue of IP and who accesses my data, or what happens when the business goes bust and I've basically decided I'd aligned with that technology. It strikes me that there's some policy issues. I think the issue of trust that Ollie mentioned, how do we generate genuinely founded trust and a collaborative, safe, yet competitive and progressive sort of set of businesses that won't leave us going either the Apple path or the Android path and going, gee, or you'll all remember the uh, video path. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, one of the big things that we see uh, providing product solutions for farmers is that the support is a big thing. The early adopters are always going to be more tech savvy than the general population. And as of that, they will have a a stronger commitment to make whatever they invest in work. And in the broader farming population, the produced population, nobody wants to do badly. They all want to do their best. And but oftentimes they're coming from a, a situation where they didn't grow up with technology. They haven't had it implemented on farms all the time. It's always just been the sweat off their own back that's made it work. And that's where they can need to rely on the people that, such as us that are providing the solutions to them to really help them through those initial stages to get them confident in the products and gain their knowledge and understanding until they can start running on their own feet. I think we're already seeing some initiatives such as um, the sheep background. So the national uh, database, Na sheep genetics is providing, we've seen uh, for the genomics, you talk about genomics testing and things like that, where you're doing DNA testing they have now mandated any provider that's providing that to the industry has to have their data go into a centralized database such that, because we've seen in the past where they've gone out of business and farmers have lost hundreds of thousands of dollars of investment in this data. So that's a really good initiative to see that happening as well. I've just sort of one thing to add probably to Tim, like just again, under the, under the like behind the scenes, like just technically, the space is really maturing. Matthew might be able to talk to this as well, but I see um, like just in terms of somebody like John Deere. So John Deere was actually one of the people in the very early days of like the ag tech space that was potentially using farmer's data as a lock-in device. So they were in like, yeah, they were basically locking you into their, to their technology and it was quite hard to extract their data and it was, and they were kind of building quite a closed ecosystem. And, and actually to their credit, there was a massive pushback from farmers over the last couple of years. And they're actually starting to um, just be much more open. So it's just the way that we now, um, as tech companies are starting to uh, link in together, we're using um, 
bits of technology which are basically putting the power in the farmer's hands to really make visible, like I mm. give permission for Platform, our startup, to see my data that exists in this satellite provider's ecosystem. So these moves like to OAuth 2.0 for authentication and, and the way that National Farmers Foundation is putting in place kind of clear data codes and actually startups which are really thinking about it actually just have to be working in the farmer's best interest or they're gonna get found out, so. Matthew, anything from your yeah. side? Yeah, totally on the right track there, Ollie. I would say, um, you know, I'd be nervous about um, policy that sort of tries to solve for the economic fate of, of any given company, but I think it's 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 absolutely the right way to go for things like the NFF Harm Data Code to be strengthened and to be, you know, really targeted at the problems that are quite specific to agricultural uses of data. Um, I think that those are reasonable. and. As, as vendors, you know, we should be prepared to be able to stand by the product. And if you're adding value and you're creating value for producers, then in return, uh, I think, you know, we are obliged as an industry to make sure that that, in, that that data remains valuable to a producer, regardless of the, you know, outcome for the company. Because going out of business is one thing, getting bored is another. Um, so it, it's very hard to make, you know, yeah, I, I guess we would say build build racetracks, not you know don't 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 back horses, and and so policy in this area I think is a very good solution. You know what what you are agreeing to if you look at the farm data code, it basically you know puts pretty significant obligations on, on vendors to make sure that uh, that farmers won't be worse off, and that's onerous and you know does increase the cost to participate. Uh, but I think if we're talking about adoption. Uh, the easily the biggest problem in adoption is psychology. You know, people are worried. People are worried about losing a sense of self-control. They're worried about unintended consequences. They're worried about somebody profiting from something that, you know, they think might be theirs or somehow is derived from them. So the farm data code, the next couple of versions of that and how it plays out um, in, a, in a technical sense, you know, absolutely the right way to address those problems. Thank you, Matthew. And I think we're going to try a question on from online. So hopefully, Pip, if you can unmute yourself and, and ask your question, we should hopefully appear on our screen shortly. Um, hi, Ollie. Can you hear me? You can, loud and clear. Thank you. So obviously a lot of, um, you know, this is a really considered plan by the um, SA uh, government. What's a really easy way that industry can participate and support this initiative? And on the flip side, you know, if you had a, a wish list, how would you like government, corporates and other agencies and bodies to, um, I suppose, lean in and actually help drive this now that you've done some of the heavy lifting? A very good point, Pip. And I, I think we, we've had a, a lot of interest expressed by industry associations and uh, other farm systems groups to say we can help implement these uh, these initiatives and I think we would that's something we want to build in as a strategy to, to do that I mentioned a couple of the other plans and uh, that are underway uh, for example uh, from wine Australia that um, we'd be crazy not to really build on that and work with them and perhaps they're the best people to implement it in that in that space um, if there's a uh, you know, a, a, a group of the pri from the private sector, or be it a sort of an industry association type, or, uh, that, that that is well placed to implement something, rather than government. I think well, government will just want to get out the way. Um, so that uh, I don't know the actual answer specifically to that, Pip, but uh, it's it's high on our list of uh, ways that we wanted to approach this strategy. Well, okay. Any more questions? Ah, uh, uh, Emma. Michelle, just Emma, just in front of you. That's right. Thank you very much. Um, I'm here. So uh, just also following on from that, um, I don't really see how we're thinking about integrating this into the education system. I know you, you talked about um, the, the value of an ag, ag degree, um, but we're seeing young agriculturalists coming out with very, very poor knowledge of ag tech at the moment. Uh, how, how do you see the, this policy actually linking in with the education? I think at all uh, a whole range of levels. I mean, there's education, of course, of uh, producers ongoing that side of things, and and I think some of these sort of demonstration facilities can help provide some of that stuff. 
uh, ultimately we're going to have to get back to the school curricula. It's going to have to go back that far. Uh, and, and how is that working? And how do you excite kids, I guess, is partly the issue. And, and, and I, I think the link of ag tech with space technologies has got to be a positive one, and we're well placed in South Australia in that regard. So uh, haven't, we haven't worked through that yet, uh, Emma, but I guess we, you know, one of the first things we'll do is go with the education department um, and, uh, and TAFE, for that matter, uh, training of, of people to say, okay, you know, this is the kind of skills that we're looking for people for the new generation. First of all, wait, what are those skills that people need to have? Uh, and how can we uh, build those more into programs and interest people in doing it? Um, not an easy task. Um, yeah. I think also it will come from adoption will breed adoption in the instance that growing up myself, I saw our farmers that I, my dad ran a uh, sheep consultancy group where he advised elite breeders. And through that, I was exposed to a lot of seeing people doing a lot of hard work, a lot of hours, everything like that. And I'm all about automation. And I actually strayed away from the sheep industry because I wanted to chase robots, chase all that sort of side of things. And I think as adoption increases through these sorts of initiatives, kids will grow up seeing those technologies implemented and they may even grow up seeing the change from their family going from a very overworked, very stressed situation to a automated situation where they're actually can sit down and talk through the kids on their iPad and say, here's our, here's our maps, here's everything like that and encourage those kids to come through and grow up with a level of excitement about the, the farm and the jobs that their parents are doing rather than a oh, geez, I don't want to do that when I'm older. Look at them, they're stressed. I want to go somewhere that's got technology sort of thing. Great. I think we'll throw to another question. Um, Hamish, if you don't mind unmuting yourself, um, and you should be coming through now. Uh, can you hear me, Ollie? Yeah, loud and clear. Yeah. Thank you, Ollie. Hi, Matt. Uh, hi, all. Um, our platform, Pear Tree, is a universal dashboard, so for the last three years have actually been uh, trying to solve many of these issues of integrations and data. So very interesting uh, conversation tonight. Thank you. Uh, my question's really back to Professor Leanna, uh, particularly about the uh, intermediaries. And you probably touched on it a little bit uh, from Pip's question, but it's, it's really about, we've seen a lot of demonstration farms. We've worked with New South Wales DPI, Western Australian DPIRD, MLA, and a number of other projects that have the demonstration farm. But I think you quite rightly identified the intermediaries as, as the next stepping stone that the local guy that you can check into. But it's probably getting into the weeds, but have you got a little bit more uh, concept of how that's going to roll out? Is there going to be more, uh, you know, support for those sort of groups or, or individuals? How How's that going to look? Uh, thanks, Hamish. I, I think it, it will. there will have to be support. I mean, I think that... Um, the ambassadors program where uh, um, existing producers are uh, prepared to stick their hands up and say this sort of technology application, this is how it works, it's fantastic, may well just be happy to do that because they want to help, you know, the whole system um, as opposed to become, you know, paid ambassadors. We haven't worked through that yet. Intermediaries, I think, it's a combination. It's one, it's a sort of a um, perhaps an organisational level of providing services. And I think Caroline's... Uh, got that sort of concept um, as having um, uh, you know, formal structures which provide an, in, an intermediary type service. But I think it's gonna be individuals rolling their sleeves up as well. And I think we have to fund a group of those people. Um, they're not that easy to find and they're damned important people because they understand what this side needs and what that side needs. And um, one system I think this kind of thing has worked well in slightly differently, but Doug Adamson's here, I think somewhere other, aren't you Doug? Where is, yeah, at the back there. Now Doug for many years was, was one of the, whatever we called them, the case managers of the um, Accelerating Commercialization Program, uh, federal government program that helped companies take products uh, to market. So it was funding that was meant to help adoption as opposed to develop technologies. And the group of people that Doug was one of, acted as a, to me as those intermediaries. They were uh, appointed by the, by the government, funded, paid by the government, and their role was to help those companies that were applying for grants to actually become competitive for those grants. Uh, and, and they ended up knowing lots of people from, you know, have you talked to this company? Have you talked to this group? 
uh, it's that kind of skill and input that we need. And I think they're skilled individuals um, and uh, not always that easy to find, but um, it's in, in every sector that way. In the health area, I think we need that. How do we get a biotech sector going well? It's, uh, yeah, it's linking people together yep. and uh, knowing how to put the jigsaw together and who, they, you know, they've got to be well networked, basically. Yep. Yeah. Um, Penny, up to you. Yeah, I was just going to add to that because um, PERSA has their red meat and wool growth program, which is... Um, already going, which is fantastic. And as part of that, they've got a really strong ag tech focus. And part of that is um, producer technology groups. So there's um, something like 20 groups or something across the, the state of producers that are really interested in how ag tech can help their farm businesses. And um, it's a facilitated process and it goes from what's going on in my business, what's really bugging me, what can I be doing better? And then finding technology to match that. And um, I haven't seen anything quite like that across the country. And so it's um, a really good initiative and there's a group in our area and um, it's got an incredible buzz and it's sort of empowering producers to almost drive their own adoption, but in a facilitated way that can link them to, to, the, to the technology if they need that link. And, and there's within our st strategy with the, the ag tech in South Australia in general, there's more linkages that I can see that are gonna come that will bring um, producers and growers closer to the developers and that's only going to be a good thing. Fantastic, thank you. And we're kind of running out of time but we've probably got time for a couple of quick questions. One more online. I think I've got, I'm um, actually joined by somebody crossing the Tasman, so Peter Ren Hilton. I think you're um, calling in from New Zealand, if you can unmute yourself. There we go. I, I, I hope that's worked. Um, so th thank you very much, Ollie. Great presentations tonight. Many thanks. Um, so I represent Agritech New Zealand. Um, currently, we're actively collaborating with the Australian Agritech Association. And I'm very interested to learn more about South Australia's interest in working with potential trans-Hasman partners, particularly around farmer adoption and trial, trial uh, farms in association with um, Australian Agritech. Um, just as some uh, context, um, two months ago we signed a deal with the New Zealand government called the Agritech Industrial Transformation Plan and much of what I've heard tonight reflects that so I'd be really interested to find out the uh, openness and willingness of South Australia to work with New Zealand and uh, you know, around some of these really key, key projects. When we open up our bubble, Peter, we'll have to uh, absolutely get together physically. We have? Adelaide has, has it? Hey! <laughs> I think absolutely. We, you know, we have to learn from each other uh, and uh, not reinvent the wheel. Um, and uh, I, I've always been impressed with New Zealand's approach to its uh, strategies. I mean, the, the, the dairy industry is the classic and, uh, you know, the world dominance it's been able to achieve. We can learn a lot from that, Peter, and I hope... Uh, and New Zealand can learn something from us as well. Great, lovely, thank you. And are there any last questions just here on the floor? Martin Andrew again, sort of a random idea. When I was a kid in the Riverland in the 1960s, they used to have gadget days, <laughs> which were sort of local farmers with little bits of tricks and things they developed and shared around and so forth. And, and I'm wondering, I know it's not perhaps I'm wondering if there's a role for that kind of concept again, or whether that's perhaps embraced in some of the initiatives that you've talked about. I think it is in the sense of, you know, some of the, the like um, uh, the um, uh, innovation hubs and so forth would be, uh, you know, could be down to something quite small. You know, it's not necessarily, you know, the grand initiative. Uh, and similarly at the demonstration site, sort of, you know, how can my little widget fit in here and how do I improve my little widget? So. You know, I, I think it's a, it's a spectrum um, and, a, and a vibrant opportunity there to, to, to cover that, including some of those things. It'd be pretty interesting, I reckon. <laughs> Penny, do you want to just... Um... I was just going to give the uh, Farmers to Founders program a plug um, because I was one of the first cohort that went through um, and no one knows farmers' problems like farmers and a lot of farmers are quite innovative as well. So... Farmers of Founders helps farmers um, not only take their problems and find the solutions, but potentially turn those solutions into commercial businesses and products. Um, and it's, it's a fantastic 
program and very well done and it's been supported by industry. And I think there's also an opportunity, like it's not as if farmers are gonna take developers jobs um, because not all farmers wanna then take that solution and run with it because farming is a very busy and complex business as it is. Um, but if, if something is real and it's um, got a real um, value proposition and benefit for the, for the industry, there's a whole bunch of developers waiting in the wings um, that can take it to the next level. Fantastic. I think that's a really nice way to wrap it up. So um, I just wanted to say um, a big thank you again to everybody who's joined us on Zoom, for you guys for coming down this evening, to the Minister, to Leanne, to Tim and to Penny and to Matthew. Um, really, really appreciated. Everybody here at Stone and Chalk, you're welcome to stay and have a chat and a beer and a wine. I think we have to still sit down while we're having it. But please enjoy and everybody at home. Hope you have a lovely evening and, and um, thank you again. And we, we look forward to kind of working with everybody to kind of push things forwards. So thank you so much and good evening.